Welcome, internet friends, to subscriber story time number seven. Before we get into the stories, I want to make you guys aware of my Twitch account, which I've just set up, so if there's nothing there, I apologize. In 2017, I want to start streaming more often. I really enjoyed it when I did it this past October, and I think it will be a great way to casually interact with you guys, and I'll mostly be playing horror games because I own a ton from batch purchases I made on Steam last year and this year, but uh, no game is off limits, I would say. So if you're into that, the link to follow me on Twitch is down in the description below. I don't even know if follow is the correct terminology for Twitch. If it's not, I apologize. Now on to story time. Since it's the season of giving, I wanted to give you guys a long holiday subscriber story time special to end the year on a high note to go out with a bag. With a bag? I wrote with a bag. It's supposed to be with a bang, but we can go out with a bag too if you want. So grab a loved one, a bag, a blanket, maybe some hot cocoa, and turn down the lights. Today we have eight subscriber submitted stories, tales of creepy basements, hellish cryptids, a deadly premonition, lost time, a bookstore with secrets, a house of shadows, ominous fog, and a tarot card nightmare. So without further ado, turn out the lights and enjoy. My basement fucking terrifies me. No, it doesn't look creepy. It's a finished basement and actually looks quite nice. I used to feel completely comfortable down there when we first moved in, but now, even the thought of bringing the laundry downstairs, especially during the night, is enough to make me burst out into nervous tears. My parents always yell at me about how childish I am being when I ask to bring our dog downstairs with me while I switch the laundry from the washing machine to the dryer. They are right, it is childish, but I can't help it. That feeling I get is just too much. I don't know exactly when it started. All I know is that the feeling has gotten increasingly vivid over time. I feel like I'm being watched by something. At first, I dismissed it as my imagination. It didn't seem harmful. That didn't last for long. Now that gaze is malevolent, and I usually find myself racing up the stairs with a basket in my arms, just trying to escape whatever is down there. There are two details to that basement that give me chills. The first is the fact that there is a small bathroom in the basement, which is normal enough. The strange thing that creeps me out to no end is the lack of a mirror above the sink or anywhere in that bathroom. The second fear-inducing detail is the door that sits at the very end of the narrow hallway where the ceiling gets a bit lower. The previous tenants of the place had replaced the carpets in the basement before leaving, but it was too thick, making it impossible to open most of the doors on that floor properly, so most of them were taken off their hinges, but not this one. Every other door in that basement has been opened once before, and I have seen inside, except that one room at the end of the hall. No one in my family has seen it, ever. It is supposed to be a cold room, you know, the places where you store food such as jams and other preserves, but that door at the end of the hall just sends off alarm bells in my head every time I see it. I don't like taking my eyes off of that hallway when I'm in the laundry room, Yet, to put stuff in the washing machine and dryer, I'd need to not only break my gaze from that hallway of nightmares, but turn my back to it completely. This is when the feeling becomes most intense, and there have been a few times when I swear I have seen things from the corners of my eyes, standing in the doorway to the laundry room. I have never been able to identify what it was I saw. My house was built only a few years ago, and we are the second family to live here, so there's no chance that this house has a violent history that may lead to ghosts. But I know that ghosts aren't the only thing on the edge of what we perceive, frightening people who come across them. My mind can't help but think the worst when it comes to theorizing about what lies behind that door. It may also be worth mentioning that, until a while ago, I was never really alone down there when doing my chores. We had a cat that would often sleep at the end of the hallway, and he rarely left the basement. That cat passed away a while ago, which was about the same time that I started to become terrified of the basement. 
I know that all this seems childish and that many will dismiss this as an overactive imagination, but before you write off my words, ask yourself, have you ever felt like you were being stalked by something unseen or felt unsafe in a place where you should be most relaxed? My name is Lavinia, and I happened to predict how my tormentor would die. Her name was Gina, and she was horrible to me throughout middle school all the way up to when I finished high school. When I first met her in middle school, she was nice to me, at first, until she came over to my house. Now, I'm not boasting at all. It took me a lot of convincing to allow her to come over because I really didn't want her to know how wealthy I was, and I just hated the extra attention people gave me once they'd found out. I'm a very shy person, and I hate too much attention, but she managed to convince me to allow her to come over that one day, and so she did. From that day on, she just changed her attitude towards me. She kept ignoring me and eventually ditched me to hang out with some other girls. She wasn't the brightest crayon in the packet, and she wasn't exactly rich, so now that I think about it, that was probably what fueled her to hate me so much. So when she left me, I was gutted, but I managed to pull through because friends come and go, right? Then she started picking on me with her new friends. And these girls were cruel. Thinking back on it makes me really upset. They would call me names like Ghost, mocking my skin color even though she was just as pale as I was, Albino because of how blonde my hair was, or Kami, which I had no idea what it meant until I had gotten into high school. They were mocking my Bulgarian heritage, which I grew up to hate so much and try to hide because of them. They would hide my stuff and have me look for it during recess until it was time to go home. They would pull my hair, push me down, and once they even went as far as to punch me in the stomach when I once stood up to their tormenting. I loathed going to school, and it somehow got worse when I reached high school. I would beg my parents to move me from that school, but they wouldn't have any of it. They insisted that the school was prestigious and good for my education. Even when I told my mother that I was getting severely bullied, she told me to get over it and focus on my education because that was all I was there to do. And honestly, that broke me down even more. In high school, Gina would get the whole class to go against me and I literally had no friends. Even if I sat alone quietly, minding my own business, she would notice this and actively go out of her way to bully me and make me feel like crap. I would cut myself and I even attempted suicide twice because I couldn't handle the torment. And you would think that would have made her tone down with the bullying, but it didn't at all. In fact, it got even worse and she and her friends would chant horrible things at me, telling me to try and kill myself again or to cut deeper. Everything was a living hell until I got to the senior year of high school. I had aged pretty well, and although my self-esteem was crushed by all the bullying, it didn't seem like I was as ugly as I felt, because I met Damien. He was the sweetest person I had ever come across, and unlike the other guys, he couldn't give less of a damn about what Gina would say about me. There was even a time that he stood up for me and put Gina down in front of everyone, to the point where Gina would not say anything whenever he was around me. He was my shield and my only companion. He even made me feel a little more confident in my own skin. He made me feel wanted and beautiful. The school prom came around and my feet couldn't touch the ground. I was so excited to go with him and I remember dolling up for the dance feeling all confident and loved. We went together and it was a blast at first. From the corner of my eye, I remember seeing Gina, dateless amongst her friends who had dates, giving me a menacing stare. Afterward, I'll admit Damien and I drank a little at the after party, and we were a little tipsy, but we were still aware of our actions, if that makes sense. I remember Damien telling me he had to go out to get some fresh air because of how stuffy the whole room was, and it didn't really bother me that I would be staying alone, so I let him go and watch some of the drunken partygoers make fools out of themselves. It was alright, until I noticed that he'd been gone for a while, and it started to bother me. I could see some of Gina's friends at the party, but, thankfully, 
They didn't seem like they were in the mood to ridicule me. But it still made me feel uneasy to be without Damien, so I left to go look for him. I had previously called him, but he didn't pick up any of my calls, so I was genuinely worried. I idly walked around the many cars parked along the driveway, desperately looking for Damien. I then saw a dimly lit car that looked familiar, and I tried calling Damien again to see a phone light up, coincidentally, in the vehicle, and then go blank after I hung up. It was definitely Damien's phone, so in necessary curiosity, I walked over to the car to see what was going on. I opened it to see Gina and him together. They were obviously in the act of having sex. I'm from a religious family, believe it or not, and Damien knew about how I wanted to wait until marriage. He never pushed me about it or made such a fuss, and it made me love him even more. But now I knew why he didn't mind. It felt like all of the air had been sucked out of me, and my knees felt very wobbly and weak. I remember leaning against another car and slouching down to the ground, bawling my eyes out. He began to quickly get dressed and get out of the car, saying, I'm sorry, I can explain, along with, She made me do it. I still love you. Long story cut short, Gina ruined the night that was supposed to be one of the only good nights of my high school years, and she stole the one person I loved and trusted. After that night, I didn't go back to my school and did the rest of my courses online or through a hired tutor. It didn't end there, though. I would get horrible texts sent to me through my Facebook by Gina and her friends. I deleted my Facebook later on. And I would get scary messages from unknown numbers telling me to go die. At this point, I'd had enough and deleted all my social media accounts and changed my phone and SIM card and moved on with my life. It all got better from then on. I got into a great college and made some awesome friends who I'd never change for the world. And I met another guy who loves me for me. I forgot about Gina for a while until one night she randomly appeared in my dream. This was when things got really weird. In the dream, she was apologizing to me, crying her eyes out, and it was so weird because I actually felt bad for her and wanted to be friends again. Then suddenly I saw her in a car. She looked different, a lot older, but I could still tell that it was her. She was driving peacefully until some massive truck came out of nowhere and rammed itself into her car, tipping it over before catching on fire and exploding with Gina still inside. I woke up to this sweating and my mouth dry. It was truly freaky. I wondered why after forgetting about her for so many months that she would just pop out of nowhere in my dreams. The next morning, I felt ill, and it was as if I was surrounded by a cloud of dread. I can't accurately describe the feeling, but it wasn't a nice one. A week later, as I was scrolling through my Facebook page, at this time I had made another Facebook account, I saw plastered all over my timeline a post with a picture of Gina with people commenting RIP and you will be missed on the post. And then I felt that same dread I had been feeling a week before flow right back into me. In curiosity, I scrolled down to see comments of people asking how she had died. Apparently she was driving down a highway and she mistakenly drove past a red light and got hit by a large truck. On another post, someone put up a photo of her car, and it was totaled, completely squashed and damaged. There was no way anyone would have survived such a wreck. I noticed that the car had burns all over it, and I could feel the tips of my fingers run cold. I clicked out of the page and stared at the screen. The worst bit was that I could feel nothing. I felt absolutely nothing. I didn't cry, didn't laugh. I couldn't do anything. It was just surreal, and I simply couldn't believe it was the reality. I went to her funeral and reunited with some of her old friends, aka my old bullies. They were all in bad shape, and all of them began profusely apologizing and crying. I couldn't feel a thing, though. The only person I've told this to is my current fiancé and some close friends, and they were all freaked out about the whole thing. But it's hard to think that I somehow managed to predict how my longtime tormentor would die. 
I know it's a bit too late, but Gina, I forgive you. When I was younger, I lived on an old farm in Wisconsin, a little west of Stevens Point. To say this farm was decrepit is an understatement. The barn's roof was falling apart when we got it. Anyway, as the only other person besides my father who lived on the property, my jobs consisted of feeding animals and helping out. One day, as I was walking to the barn to help my father, I got an uneasy feeling. I stopped and listened, trying to figure out what was wrong. Nothing. That was just it. There was nothing. On a farm that had geese, sheep, dogs, cats, etc., the list goes on, no sound was made except for the whistle of the wind in the trees. I called out for my father, who I thought was in the barn, but received no reply. I didn't dare go into the barn. I was too creeped out at what was going on. I ran back to the house looking for my father, or really anything else that had lived on the farm. This proved to be a mistake. Running straight through the kitchen, I was halted at the doorway into the living room. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw something terrifying. A humanoid creature sat propped up above the doorway, one arm on the open door and the other on the door's frame. It had a head and a torso, but no legs. My eyes slowly moved closer to see what exactly was there, and I realized it was staring at me. Its flesh looked melted like a candle over a metal flame, except it was dark red and black from char. My eyes drifted to its face, but when I met where its eyes would have been, I looked away near instantly. The sockets were black balls, but I felt its gaze peering at me. I had never been so scared of anything in my life, and have never been since. I couldn't move. I was frozen. It felt like hours were passing. I was visibly shaking and could do nothing but wait for it to do something. I looked at it, its image still scarred in my brain, its claw-like hands, what looked like a spine hanging down below it. It looked like something that had actually crawled out of hell. That's when my father came in. He didn't see what I was looking at, as he came in the same way I did, but he saw me staring and shaking in place. He grabbed me by the shoulder and asked me what was wrong, but when I looked back after being moved, it was gone. For the next two years that I lived in that house, I always carried a big wooden cross with me, never moving without it. I never saw that thing again, nor do I wish to. I am generally a logical person, but I can't think of anything to explain this. I wasn't asleep, so it wasn't a night terror. The only way I can think of to describe it is the embodiment of hatred. I worked for a few years at a small bookstore owned by my aunt and uncle in the quaint California mountain town of Placerville, formerly known as Hangtown, as this is where many criminals of the Gold Rush era would meet their fate at the Hanging Tree at the end of Main Street. Placerville is notoriously haunted by those from other times, and its current residents take a certain amount of pride in this fact. Our bookstore, which is part of a long line of buildings along Main Street, required a lot of remodeling once we took it over. The front of the building was modern, but about midway through the rectangular space was the original stone and iron storefront from the 1800s that created a second room in the back. There were only two doors, and one of them was in the back of the building, but it was kept locked and quite often blocked off with bookshelves. While replacing part of a section of the floor, the archway of a secret tunnel, one of many that run into the hills behind the building, was discovered. These were used mostly by gentlemen discreetly going up to the many brothels on the hill that used to exist, or later to move bootleg alcohol. Although this one had caved in, you could see the brickwork that held it into place, and a few small items were found. Instead of covering it up, we put up a large plexiglass window in the floor so it could be seen. Working there alone was quite the experience. Although I usually never felt anything threatening, certain spirits let me know they were there right away. I'd arrived in the morning and upon opening the door, I could hear what sounded like people talking, the clink of glasses and silverware, sometimes faint music. I'd say, hey everybody, 
and it would stop. After arranging the tables full of books the night before to perfection, you would come in the next morning and they would all be moved around chaotically. We had a stereo that was plugged in behind a large shelving unit. The end of the plug was right up against these shelves and it was impossible for the plug to move or wiggle out of socket. Yet, whenever certain CDs were played, the stereo would unplug itself. We'd move the heavy shelves enough to plug it back in and at one point used gaffer's tape to make sure it wouldn't move, but it would happen again and again with certain styles of music. We stopped playing those CDs. When leaving at the end of the day on my way out the door, I would say, Good night, everyone, as it just felt like the polite thing to do. But there was one day that I will always remember and will always creep me out. One Sunday afternoon, I was at the counter entering new books into our inventory. There was no one in the store but myself, and it had been a very slow day. The glass counter I stood at was located in the middle of the room against the right-hand wall, so you could keep an eye out for shoplifters. As the front door had three large bells on it, you couldn't come in or go out without making a significant amount of noise. There was no way someone could come in or leave without me seeing or hearing them. I hear the doorbells rattle and look up to see a young girl, maybe in her late teens, early 20s, walk in. She was thin, dark hair, modern clothing, and looked to be of Chinese origin. Two things struck me right away. She looked incredibly angry, and as she walked, she stomped with a heavy step. She seriously shook the floor as she quickly made her way to the back of the room. I'm a large guy, and later I tried to recreate the heaviness of her step, and I couldn't do it. So, as this pissed off, lead-footed girl walked by me, heading towards the children's book section, located in the back, right past the tunnel and original storefront, I said hello but she didn't seem to even notice me. Anyone who has worked customer service knows, sometimes you just go with it and don't ask. About a half hour passes as I continue to do my work. No one else comes into the store and I don't hear or see the girl. I decide to go back to make sure everything is cool, but it's not. There's no one there. No sign of this girl at all. Confused, I look all over the place, behind stuff, under tables, but nothing. There is simply no way she could have gotten out of the back door, as it was blocked and she didn't leave out the front, as I would have seen or heard her. To read this, it may not seem all that strange or frightening, but I assure you, it's incredibly unnerving. She was as real as real could be, and I felt the floor shake as she walked, but not a sign of her after. An uneasy feeling hung with me the rest of the evening as people who didn't disappear came and went. As closing time arrived, I was putting some of the books I had checked in earlier onto the shelves. At this point, I had locked the front door and had the music up a bit louder than usual. Suddenly, I felt something very heavy knock me on the back of my head, hard enough to hurt. I turn around and on the floor is a large, thick, hardcover book that had been in a display about 10 feet behind me. The book was in a metal wire rack at an angle. It could not have fallen out and I didn't bump into anything. That book flew at me with intent. As I'm sure you can guess, I got out of there in a hurry and asked to take a few days off. Nothing like it happened again. I've thought about this many, many times over the years, trying to figure out a rational way to explain what happened that day, but I can't. The fact that the girl was probably Chinese is interesting, as during the California Gold Rush, thousands of Chinese immigrants lived and died in the area. Many of the women working the brothels were young Chinese girls. We later found out that the back of the building, starting at the stone and iron storefront, and where the tunnel is, was once the town morgue and years later, a restaurant. A noted psychic wrote about her experiences in Peeville a couple of years ago. She wrote specifically about one of the men from the 1800s who never learned to read and was frustrated about it, and that he would sometimes vent his anger by moving or throwing books around. A while later, the store closed and became something else yet again. They say Placerville is full of ghosts, and I know this to be true. I am a firm believer in the paranormal, but I don't think every strange thing that happens to me is a ghost or a demon. 
Mostly, I'm a skeptic, unless I cannot figure out what is going on. This story is one of the most terrifying that I have ever experienced. When I was in middle school, my older sister's two best friends often spent the night. They kept to themselves sometimes, but also hung out with me much of the time. One of her friends had found tarot cards at home. Since she had been hanging out with her family, which is Christian, our influence was rubbing off on her. She decided she wanted to burn the cards as a symbol of cleansing her past. My mother was happy with the idea and said we should be careful and use a metal bowl and the stove as a source of fire. She was nearby and had a baking soda on the counter just in case the flames got out of control. The cards were burning easily. We kept igniting them, one after the other. I had a strange feeling in my stomach as we continued lighting them and placing them in the steel bowl. Often, I would get feelings of dread or panic when something is about to happen. Usually, I don't say anything because people think I'm crazy, so it's easier to avoid the conflict. I looked at my sister, and she didn't seem to be having the same issue as I was. She was simply conversing with her friends about how proud she was that her friend was coming closer to Jesus. Then we got to the final card, the devil card. Just like the other cards, we poked the corner between the black metal bars of the burners. It charred, but didn't light. Suddenly, the strange feeling turned to fear. Something wasn't right. My sister took a match and attempted to burn the card from another corner. The flames wouldn't catch. We decided to ask my mother if she would try to burn the card with a lighter. Her attempts failed. Everyone began discussing how weird it was, and unease fell on all of us. Since us kids were so frightened, my mother took us outside to our yard to burn it on a larger scale. We lived in a neighborhood where houses were close, but not too close. There was a three-foot-tall and long brick planter that was about a foot wide and divided our yard from our neighbor's yard. It was autumn, so the perennial draping flowers that bloomed through the summer were all shriveled and dead. I began hearing strange noises that, at first, I thought were just the wind. Soon, I clearly heard them as whispers and laughter. Not wanting to freak anyone out, I kept it to myself, but everyone seemed to be looking around and guessing for themselves what the sounds were. My sister shoved the card into the soil of the planter, so it was sticking out a bit. We gathered dead leaves and small sticks from the yard and lit the tinder. Naturally, it was slightly chilly and windy outside, so we all stood around the planter to shield it from the wind. The card hardly seemed phased by the flames at first, but after a while it finally caught fire. Suddenly, the wind blew in a hard gust. I began to pray out loud, asking God to protect us and allow us to destroy the devil card to purify it. Growling sounds came from all around, and I was extremely frightened but I knew that if something so terrifying was happening to simply burn a tarot card, it must really need to be done. I continued to pray, and the card hissed and burnt down until only the piece that was in the soil remained. We used a pair of tongs and made sure it burnt completely. As the last flame left the charred remains, the wind seemed to instantly dissipate. It was so bizarre and horrifying that my heart seemed to stop for a moment. Spring came and the flowers didn't return, which they had every year. We had burnt things in the planter before, and they had come back just fine. The area was generally ignored, so no one went over to investigate until early summer, when my family was cleaning up the yard and washing the side of the house. My mother called me and my sister over after she made a loud gasp. She showed us how there were worms in the planters. Not just one or two, but hundreds. The entire tree by one planter was completely filled with huge black worms. It was strange, but what made it even more so was the fact that the bottom of the planter was brick, and no worms could crawl into it from there. The soil, if you'd even call it that, was black and chalk-like. It looked strange and smelt odd, not rich and fertile like soil should be with so many worms processing it. It was as if the soil had been tainted by the remains of the tarot card that was burnt there months before. I skipped a year when I was little. It is a true story, and I still don't understand it. 
I am not sure of my age at the time this happened, but I would guess I was maybe about five or six. It was Christmas and we had all the decorations up, had the gifts and the dinner. Then we had a week and celebrated New Year with my grandparents, like we always did before taking the decorations down a few days later. I remember my mom and dad pulling them all off the ceiling and the walls to pack them away for the year. Sad to see them go in the box, but Christmas time was over. It can't have been so in reality, but to me, about a week passed. Then my dad was up on the ladder sticking Christmas decorations to the ceiling. I remember being very confused and asking him why they were going back up. He said it was because it was coming up to Christmas and said it in a way that sounded a bit surprised as if I should have already known that. I stood there puzzled for a moment and then just asked him, haven't we just had Christmas? He replied, not since last Christmas. I thought there might be some sort of calendar thing I didn't know about where you have a really short year or something and end up with two Christmases close together. I asked in a different way to clear it up more. I mean, didn't you just take those down last week? I thought we just had Christmas. He looked at me confused and told me it had been a full year, 12 months since they'd last been put up. They had come down in January and had been in boxes in the attic. I was completely lost and didn't know what else to say or ask. In my head, it had really been a week apart, but my dad assured me it had been a year. We carried on and had Christmas, but it all felt a bit strange to me. When they came down this time, everything was back to normal, and I don't normally think about it. It just comes to my mind every now and then. I think the mix of it being Christmas time now and seeing the video you did with Mortis about time glitches just brought it back up. I am 34 now, and I still can't figure out what happened. I am now a real-life ghost hunter, so I am used to dissecting things to try and find out the truth behind him. I have a part of me that wants to think it was something weird and supernatural because I love that kind of thing, and would like to be able to say I have first-hand experience of an inexplicable event. However, the more rational side of me is worried about the possibility of a suppressed, terrible memory, that my head is just skipping over something traumatic. I have often tried to see if I have something hidden in there, but nothing has ever even slightly emerged. I genuinely believe there is no suppressed memory. I have considered the idea that it could be a dream or a false memory, but it is still so real, I struggle with the idea of it being anything but 100% fact. I know I can't fully rule these things out just because I feel so sure it genuinely happened and I am certain I don't have any suppression, but all I can really say with total clarity is that when I do think of it, it creeps me the fuck out. From the ages of three months to seven years old, I lived in a house in a bad part of town that was built in the 1950s. My parents bought the house because it was cheap and conveniently right across the street from my grandparents, who often babysat me. Though in a bad location, the house was nice for the price and perfect for the small family we were. You entered through a heavy antique wood door into a quaint living room, and on your right was a dining area and then a kitchen, and to the left, a hall with a bathroom, then three bedrooms. The last of the three had its own bathroom, and was at the very end of the hall. Immediately after purchase, my parents had the door replaced and the property blessed, because the thick wooden door had an upside-down cross and Latin words deeply carved into it. They didn't have any problems until they moved me from their room to my first nursery. My aunt had bought my parents a top-of-the-line baby crib that they set up in the front bedroom of the house. Every night I would cry, as babies do, and every night my father would sleepily walk into my room to be shocked awake by his infant child sitting in the middle of the floor, out of her crib. This was not only eerie because the crib was definitely escape-proof, but that it happened at the same time every night. This was before home surveillance cameras were widely accessible, so my worried dad spent weeks trying to figure out what the problem was. He tested ways I could have possibly gotten out, but couldn't prove any of his theories. He decided to spend the night in the room with me to see what happened, but within an hour of laying down, he got the intense feeling of being watched, and the room became increasingly cold. 
From that night on, my crib stayed in my parents' bedroom, and we only used that room for company or storage. As I got older, my parents knew I couldn't sleep with them forever, so they decided to place me in a second bedroom. For a few weeks, all was well. I distinctly remember waking up one night. I couldn't have been more than four, and looking into my closet, which didn't have a door, at the end of my bed and seeing several different shadows, each with piercing yellow eyes. I was frozen in fear and pretended I didn't see them. I had woken up because I had heard whispering and I realized it was coming from these shadows. I shut my eyes and opened them just hoping they would go away, but they remained. Their black form shifting in my closet, but their yellow eyes remaining trained on me. I knew I couldn't fall asleep and I was too afraid to scream. So after what felt like ages, I bolted out of my room and into my parents where I told them about the yellow-eyed phantoms in my closet. They thought I was simply having a nightmare, but let me stay with them. Nightmare or not, the memory of those yellow eyes staring back at me still haunts me today. I slept with my parents the rest of the time we lived in that house and refused to go in either of the other bedrooms past sundown. I often had nightmares of being alone in various rooms of the house with a figure in a long black cloak slowly walking towards me. Occasionally I heard whispers when walking past the second room at night and had the constant feeling of being watched. I would take baths in the bathroom in the hall and would beg whichever parent watching me not to leave because once I was alone I would begin to panic as I felt someone was always behind me. If they absolutely had to leave, they would turn the radio on up on the vanity, because in the silence I would sometimes catch low whispers drifting down the hall or see a shadow quickly dart past the doorway. You would think this would be almost torturous, but since I had only known living in a haunted house, some of these things didn't strike me as abnormal until I was older. I also acquired an imaginary friend who helped me quell some of my fear. His name was Uncle Lebo, and he was a grown man from Manchester, England. What was strange was I had no idea there was a Manchester or that it was in England when he appeared. I don't remember what he looked like exactly, other than that he was very tall and sometimes liked to dress as a woman. He would tell me about things I was curious about, and this would freak my parents out because often it was information a four to six year old would have no idea about. I remember once he appeared, I didn't have the nightmares about the hooded specter anymore, and the whispers were a lot less frequent. Once we moved, I only saw Uncle Lebo a few times before he completely disappeared. In mine and my parents' opinion, he was a guardian angel of someone who had passed sent to protect me from whatever was in that house, but who knows, maybe my imagination or intention of information was just stronger than most kids. Sometimes we still drive by that old house, and I know the new owners have children because of all the toys strewn about the lawn. I just want to know, do their children hear the whispers, get the nightmares, and see those piercing yellow eyes? Where I was living with a few roommates was a rather rural area in central Massachusetts, near the Connecticut border. Skipping ahead... One of my roommates and I set out at about zero dark thirty to do some grocery shopping across town. The route there took us through a neighborhood with some rather fun, twisty roads. As I was driving, I noticed the bushes and yards on either side of the road were catching my headlights strangely. Curious, I stopped and investigated. What I found surprised me. Frost hung on the leaves and branches. It was mid-August, and it was warm enough that we had the windows down in the car trying to keep cool. Very puzzled, but not freaked out, I relayed my find to my roommate, and we discussed it to the end of the road where it met a slightly more traveled one. What stopped us was a horrible stench of death hanging in the air. Since this happened, I joined the army and deployed twice to Iraq. There, we had to go to a morgue and identify a body as one of the people we were looking for. The smell of an unrefrigerated morgue was about what we smelled coming from the cemetery that took up most of the other side of the road from the neighborhood. If that wasn't strange enough, my headlights would not shine into the back part of the cemetery. Not meaning they weren't aimed wrong, 
The beams of light just stopped just past the third or fourth row of headstones. What really caught my eye, though, was just beyond the line where my lights did not shine past was a bank of fog. Starting to get a little weirded out, we still just shrugged it off and continued on. Next on our trip, at the end of the cemetery, there was, and still is, a sepulcher. Not being the first time we saw it, what was strange this time was the door was open. The stench of death was even stronger here, but I was at speed and just kept going. We got to the store with no further incident and left, discussing taking a different, longer route home to avoid the smell. Getting onto that road, we drove into a bit of fog. Nothing readily out of the ordinary, it was common to find a thin layer in this area. As I drove on, the fog got thicker and thicker, to the point I couldn't see anything aside from a white cloud illuminated by my headlights, so thick I could not see the end of my hood. The way this road went, it snaked through another neighborhood, but met up with the first one we were on that night, on the far end away from the cemetery. Needless to say, I stopped, threw the car in reverse, and after giving my roommate an odd look, backed into a place I could turn around and took the extra long way home. Finally getting home, we parked in front of the house, got out, and grabbed our groceries, and stopped dead in our tracks as we heard a growl that came from a creature so big we felt it more than we heard it. We ended up calling the cops to investigate the area across from where we heard the noise. Not surprisingly, they found nothing. After they left, my roommate and I spent about a half hour chatting about what that noise could have been. When we stopped, I had the bright idea to grab my bow and arrows and head outside to see what I could find. My roommate followed close behind with a sword drawn. Yes, we were, and still are, those kind of strange people. Anyway, behind the house and set down a hill was an old mill, and a driveway that went even lower to a garage under the mill. The smell had traveled over to this area, as did the fog. I stoutly trekked off to find out what was going on, but when I got to the driveway that wrapped around below the mill, the fog hung thick and low. There was a small stream back there, so I still was resolute in finding something out. The driveway was pitched down fairly steeply, and as I walked no more than ten feet down it, the temperature dropped a good ten degrees. This stopped me dead in my tracks, and with a look to my roommate, we came to the silent agreement we should go back to the house, which we did, and ended up passing out talking about the weird events of the night. While the story should stop there, it didn't. The next morning, I went outside for some reason and saw my windshield, undamaged the night before, cracked from one side to the other in a clean arc, as if something very heavy landed on the roof of the car and put enough pressure on it to bend the windshield enough to crack it cleanly. We never heard anything else from whatever it was, and after repairing the windshield, saw no other evidence of its presence. Even driving past the cemetery, the sepulchre had its door shut and sealed as well. Some other strange things happened in years I lived there, but none even close to that warm night in August. Special thanks to Hale, Lavinia, Kaz, Carissa, Chad, Violet, Christopher, and Alexis for sharing their stories with us today. If you have a personal terrifying encounter you've had, it can be paranormal or not, please feel free to send it to subscriberstorytime at gmail.com and your experience might end up in the next subscriber story time. If you wish to stay anonymous, please mention that in your email. Thank you for listening to the end today, and if you liked the video, it would really help me out to leave a like and a comment down below, and if you aren't already, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos from me. Stay safe, friends, have a happy new year, and have a good night.